while I was waiting to live. My life's been waiting on me. I'm gonna run. I'm gonna fly. I wanna know what it means to live and not just be alive. The world's gonna hear you here. Cause I'm gonna shout. I will be dancing when circumstances drown the music. Proverbs chapter 21, please. Our teacher's heart was not simply to do a church in the traditional sense of a church. It was to have a fellowship. It was to have a gathering in a home. It was to have a family atmosphere. A place where you got to know each other for good and bad a place where you got to eat together. It was a family environment. That's why they call it the family of God. Now, each one of you come from a family. Okay? And I don't have to tell you that family life is not the Brady Bunch. That's a lie. Okay, when that series was on TV, it was a nice thing to look at, but that is not true. Did anybody grow up in a family like that, where everything was right? And, no. It's a family. You see? This is why I don't put on a show for people. You see? Anybody can put on a show for people. Anybody can stand behind a lectern and look good for an hour or an hour and a half a week, read a script, follow a script, and put on a show for people. But that's not God's heart. God wanted a family. God talked about David. God showed you David's life. The good, the bad, and the ugly, right? That's family. Do you understand? And you learn about that, and that's reality. God showed you about Moses, his sister, they had a squawk. Do brothers and sisters fight? Sure. But they're still what? Family. You understand? And that's why we have always tried to make a family environment. Okay? So if you're going to look at me and try to micromanage my life or my dress, you're going to be sad. See? Do you do that to your daddy, or your mommy, or your husband, or your wife, or your child? Because if you do, there's something wrong with you. It's a family. You understand? There's nothing false here. There's nothing phony here. You won't see me different. I am the way I am. Okay? You come here because of God's word. Because you love one another. You don't come here because of me. Okay? Don't come here because of me. Come here because of the truth. Because you know why? You will find no error or opportunity in the truth unless you yourself are out in left field. But you can find plenty of error and opportunity in my walk. That's why I tell you, don't look at me. Come here for the word. I got an amen from the black guy. <laughs> Uh, you're brown. Okay, I got to remember from the brown guy. <laughs> from the short brown guy. <laughs> he said that, not me. <laughs> All right. Look at Proverbs 21, please. Verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the hearts. Every way of man is right in his own eyes. Everybody comes up with a brilliant scheme or a brilliant idea or a brilliant way and it's always, I got the answer. They're always right in their own eyes. See? 
But the rest of the verse says, The Lord pondereth the heart. Now, the word pondereth here, it's the Hebrew word takan, T-A-W-K-A-N. And what that Hebrew word means, it means to balance. It means to weigh, to weigh out, to make equal, to weigh out, to make equal. It's a word that relates to weights and balances. If you take your Bibles and go all the way to the end, to the book of Revelation. Revelation 6. Revelation 6, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast saying, Come and see, and I beheld in low black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The oil and the wine. The words pair of balances translate the Greek word zugon, Z-U-G-O-N, zugon. The word zugon literally means yoke. It's a yoke. Like you have a yoke on a yoke of oxen, that wooden beam that ties the two ox together. The wooden beam is a beam of balance. And the beam of balance joins or couples two pans together, just like it couples two joints, it joins two oxen together. The joint oxen are supposed to be evenly matched. So the purpose of the balance is to determine that the contents of the oxen or the two pans, for instance, okay? The two pans are even or are equal. My visual aid. This is a balance. This is the balance beam here, like a yoke. See, it looks like a yoke. And what this is supposed to do, so what this is supposed to do is to be even on both sides. Today we have little experience with pairs of scales or balances. And yet, until recently, they were commonly used as means of weighing substances. A pair of scales used in a western movie to determine the weight of a gold nugget. Right? Or the balance scales representing the international symbol of justice depicting the supposed equality of all before the law, which today is not, but it, that's what it's supposed to represent. In Bible times, the value or quantity of a thing was determined by weighing it on scales, by weighing it on scales. People bought and sold items by weight or measurement rather than based on our currency system today. For instance, a shackle was not originally a unit of money, but a weight according to which price and quantity things were determined. As such, scales were commonplace market items and God demanded them to be used justly. Well, what does that mean? So, if I went to the marketplace and I wanted to buy this here monkey, I'd say, I want monkey. So, if I want monkey, I put monkey in the scale. Ooh, monkey had a big breakfast. <laughs> so then I get 
money. This is going to represent money. So I go to the merchant and I say, I want to purchase monkey for money. So I take some money and I put it in this side of the scale. Hey, okay. Is it even? Yeah. Pretty much? So, that's how I would do it. I would weigh out the amount of money I need equal to monkey. And you know what I would get? Monkey. monkey. That's how it worked. It was supposed to be even. See? But, if I was a dishonest merchant, and when no one was looking, I went like this, I'd have to have more money to buy monkey. And God didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. Now monkey's mine. That's the scales. Okay? Look at Leviticus 19, please. Leviticus 19. Look at verse 36. Just balances, just weights, a just ephod, and a just hen shall you have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe all my statutes, all my judgments, and do them. I am what? The Lord. God told Israel that they were to have just weights and just balances. In other words, if it said 25 ounces on the weight, it had to be 25 ounces. See? And he wanted them to deal with them righteously. Remember I talked to you about Hero the second. He was the king of Syracuse. I remember I, I taught you in one of the classes about Archimedes. He was a scientist. Hero the second had this gold crown. But he was under suspicion that the goldsmith that he gave the gold to make the crown, mixed in some silver. But he couldn't tell without melting down the crown. If the crown was all gold, then he would have ruined the crown. So he went to Archimedes and he said, listen, I don't think this guy put all gold in this crown. I think he used some silver, but I can't prove it. So Archimedes wrestled with this problem for a long time. And as the story goes, he got into his bathtub one day, and as he got into his bathtub, he noticed that when he got in, their water overflowed out of the bathtub. So he displaced the water that was in the bathtub, hence the law of displacement. He said, Eureka, which is Greek, which means I got the answer, I found it. He was so excited, he got up naked, and ran through the streets of Syracuse. <laughs> Got himself to the king. I guess the king put a towel around and said, what you want, boy? <laughs> and so he developed a mathematical formula to be able to take the crown, see how much was displaced, see how much gold weighed, see how much silver weighed. Long story short, the king was right. The guy put silver inside the middle of the gold crown. Needless to say, he didn't have a good head day, hair day that, or a head day. See? But you know why? Because it wasn't balanced. He lied. And Archimedes found a way to understand that. God wanted just balances. He wanted just scales be used. It says again in Proverbs 2, Every way of man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the heart, or the Lord weighs the heart. And he weighs it to make sure that it's just, that it's right. See? The Lord is a just God 
who ponders or justly weighs the heart and thoughts, the intentions and the deeds of every man and every woman. Because every way of man or every way of woman is always right in their own eyes. That's why they act the way they act, because they think they're right. However, man and woman do not always reflect God's ways or God's heart, God's intent or God's deeds in their life. Isaiah says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher above the earth, so are my ways above yours and my thoughts above your thoughts. See, God's thoughts are different. God's ways are different. You might concoct something in your mind and say, ooh, this is a great idea. <laughs> you and your three friends, me, myself, and I. And you pat yourself on the back. But God may say, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Did you ever consider so-and-so? And he weighs out that plan. If that plan is pleasing and acceptable before the Lord, then that plan will work. If it's not, you will reap the consequences of it. And you know what man does because he's prideful? When the plan begins to fail, he throws more money at it. Or he throws more ideas at it. Or he reevaluates it and makes it worse. He not, very seldom does he stop to seek to ask the Creator's advice. Very seldom does he stop to say, Is this a good idea, God? Or should I seek you in prayer for a while? Maybe I should talk to some godly people and run this by them. See? This is why you need to be humble so you can first see and then you can receive the truth of God in your life. If you are not humble, if you are a know-it-all, if no one can teach you anything, you are in a bad position. I'm going to show you what kind of position you're in. Look at verse 4 of Proverbs 21. Go back to Proverbs 21, verse 4. Proverbs 21, verse 4. A proud look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is what? Sin. Okay, here you go. Pride is sin. This kind of pride. Not something you're proud of your child because they hit a home run or something. This kind of pride. Pride is sin. Is that what the Bible says? That's what the Bible means. It's very simple. Pride or a proud heart is sin. One of the results of sin is unbelief. Unbelief defeats the promises of God in your life. Here's your scripture. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Listen. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, what is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of what? Sin. See, sin hardens your heart. It hardens your heart. When your heart is hard, you can't be humble. Your heart has to be like a sponge, not a rock. Your heart, if it's like a sponge, will drink in God and God's word. But if your heart is like a rock, heart of stone, the water would just, the word would just go off of it. See? Don't fight with God. Okay? Keep your heart tender. Stay open to the voice of God. One of the problems that Israel had was that Israel was a stiff-necked, hard-hearted people and he, they were confronted throughout the whole Old Testament for being stiff-necked and hard-hearted look at Ezekiel 18 Ezekiel 18 
Takan. That's what the word pondereth means. It means to weigh. Takan. Ezekiel 18, verse 25. Yet you say, remember I said don't argue with God? Listen, this is the prophet speaking for God. Yet ye say, the Lord is not equal. There's your Hebrew word, takan. He doesn't weigh things out right. He's not fair. He's one-sided. That's what the people say. You say, the Lord's not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Same Hebrew word. And your ways unequal? Same Hebrew word. See, God doesn't just sit there and let people talk. He said, I'm not unequal. He said, I'm not unbalanced. You're unbalanced. Your ways are unbalanced. This is what they were squawking about. They didn't like the way God was doing things. So you know what they did? They argued with God. You know why? Because their heart was full of pride. Because they knew better, don't you know? They were going to teach the Creator how He should run the universe. They were going to teach the Creator the laws that He should enact that man should be governed by. And here's what they were squawking. Verse 26. When a righteous man, this is what God says, when a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them for his iniquity that he had done, he shall what? Die. Okay, what's that say in Norristown? If you go out and play in the street and get hit by a truck, it's your fault because you're dumb. That's what it says. When you're doing something you shouldn't do and a tractor trailer runs you over, don't squawk. 27. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul. What? Alive. Okay, they didn't like that. See, they, they didn't like that people who made mistakes got forgiven and got back on the good path, and God says, me and you are okay. Buy you a burger later on tonight. That's what God said. They didn't like that. They didn't like when the guy that was doing right made a boo-boo, and he got wasted. But they also didn't like when the guy that was doing wrong repented, and he got better. Now, they got a better way of living life. Verse 28, Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live and not die. Yet, saith the house of Israel, okay, this is what God says. He said, but you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. It's not balanced. Same word. It's one-sided. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? They're balanced. Are not your ways unequal? You're the one with the problem. And you see, people that have pride, they're always looking at someone else to blame the problem on. Or some circumstance or some situation, you understand. They never look at themselves. And you know what? That person can go to California, and you know what's going to happen? The pride that's in that person is going to corrupt their life in California. And then they're going to blame California. So they're going to move to Mexico get themselves a taco <laughs> and they think because they moved away everything's better but the pride in their life is going to corrupt them in Mexico and then they're going to go to wherever they go because you know why the problem's not the person the problem's not the situation the problem's not everybody else the problem's it's me oh lord I am just an accident looking for somewhere to take place because my heart is blinded by pride and everybody else is wrong except for the great, wonderful Nick. See? Look what pride does to a person now. Therefore, I will bless you. Doesn't say that, does it? Pride brings judgment. Therefore, I would judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his way, saith the Lord. And here's God's heart. It's always God's heart. Repent and turn 
yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. That's all God wants. Be a good girl. Be a good boy. That's all. And you won't get paddled. Be good. God doesn't want to see you get hurt. See? Cast away your transgressions. Whereby you have transgressed. And I'll make you a new heart. And a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord. Wherefore, turn ye yourselves and live. God doesn't, he's not happy. It doesn't bless God to see his children get hurt. It doesn't bless God to see his children living in pride and destruction, hurting themselves and hurting others. That doesn't bless God. He wants people to be happy. People who argue with God are prideful. And pride is what? Sin. That's what the Bible said, right? Pride is sin. That means what is contrary to the word and they're proud about it and they want to argue with God. That's a sin. That's a sin. Pride celebrations around the world are nothing more than mankind's prideful, rebellious display of sins. That's all it is. It's what it is. You can fly as many colorful flags as you want. Okay? It's just a display of sin. It shows their arrogance, their rebellion, and their pride against the Creator. Should a church argue with God? Is that a good thing for a church to argue with God? See? So you don't tell God, hey, you're wrong here, bro. We're going to fly the rainbow flag in this church. You don't know what you're talking about. Your ways are unequal. You're an old, fogey, fashion God. You need to get woke. <laughs> Hold it till afterwards. I'm on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you can't. Don't do that. Don't be dumb. That's dumb, right? Mm -hmm. That's arguing with God. That's, That's man and woman knowing better than God. See, and like it or not, you shouldn't argue with a godly minister. If the minister is ungodly, you know what you should do? Leave. That's what you should do. I am encouraging you right now and telling you right now, thus saith the Lord, if you think that I am an ungodly minister, find yourself a godly place to go and leave. And I love you and I'll plant you there gladly. Really. You should not put up with me. You should not put up with my sin, my rhetoric, my evil. That is your fault. You're stupider than stupid, dumber than dirt if you want to put up with that kind of junk. Amen. There's no, no rope around your neck. There's no place to join here. You don't have to sign nothing. It's your responsibility before God to leave. However, if God offends your sin in your life by way of my ministry, don't get mad at me. See, I didn't write the book, but I sure as heck am going to stick to that book as close as I can, the best I can for the rest of my life, because I want to represent him accurately. And if God told me that flying a rainbow flag is okay and that he was wrong, I'd be the first to put a flag up. You know why? Because when you're full of pride, you don't listen to God. <clears throat> you got to be humble. There have been times in my life where I have had to make a 360. Okay? Because I was wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying that. You do think I care if you know that I make mistakes? <laughs> do you think that I'm not going to eat my lunch today and sleep like a baby tonight when you think knowing that I am imperfect? 
<laughs> I tell my wife I care more about whether my french fries are dark or light than some of these problems. I don't care. I, I love you, but that I'm human. I got nothing to hide here. When you're at the top rung of the ladder, you know the only way you can go? Yeah. That's why I am a cellar dweller. <laughs> I'm a work in progress. Amen. I'm working towards the top. Yes. Oh. And when you fall, you only got one step below. It's That's okay. Right. <laughs> it's like a baby. You ever see a baby fall? They got this big diaper on, right? It's got bad, it's just this much padding. And they're waddling along. And, and they're only, they only go this far. Because from their butt to their ground is only this far. And they don't get hurt. They laugh, they get up, right? You laugh. But if you're seven feet tall and you don't have a diaper on, it hurts from that ladder. That's why you should never be bigger in, in your own mind than what you really are. <laughs> That's why Chef be small. That was a compliment. He complimented you. <laughs> we rehearsed that last night. <laughs> Pride in our context refers to a sinful, arrogant, haughty attitude or spirit that causes a person to have an inflated or puffed up view of themselves. We're not talking about taking pride in a job well done, anything like that. Pride causes separation and opposition towards God. See? The clearest and most pronounced example of pride in the scripture is Satan himself. A former angel, he was not content with his status or station. Instead of submitting to the rule of the Almighty, Satan opposed God. Isaiah tells how he fell from the sky from the morning because he wanted to ascend to heaven and exalt his throne above God's throne. He wanted to ascend to the heights of the clouds and be like the Most High. I said that pride causes separation and opposition towards God. Satan tempted mankind with pride in Genesis. Pride was the main temptation that Satan used to get mankind on his side. The temptation was to be like God. That was a temptation that he used, to be like God. Now you've got to understand, they were already exalted to the high position of being made in the image of God. But that wasn't good enough. Satan said, I got one better. Don't worry about being made in the image of God. You can be like God and know good and evil. And that's what he tempted them with. And that's what happened. Instead of relying and trusting on God and his word, Adam and Eve succumbed to Satan's lies. And they sinned against God. Remember I said that pride causes separation and opposition to God? When Adam and Eve sinned against God, what happened? They were separated from God. They were in opposition to God. That's all we're going to handle this morning. We'll continue Thursday night with part two. But I want you to see that pride is a sin. Now the world won't tell you that. The world tells you the direct opposite of that. This is something you should all get on board with. You should all be proud of. You should all support. No, no, it's not. I'm going to tell you something in closing. I thought about this deeply for weeks, months. I am amazed. I really am. When you know the Word of God and you see the plain, simple truth of God's Word, I am amazed at how stupid the world is. If God says it's white, you know what they say? It's black. And then they spend a hundred billion dollars to prove it's black. They put like sin and defeat and misery on, on top of each other. People, this is truth. Don't worry about it. Because the world's going to pass away. That's what the Bible says. But the word of God liveth and abideth forever. You're living your life. I'm here to help you live your life to stay on God's word. Because one day you're going to be thankful that you stood put on God's word for all that you're going to enjoy in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Thank you for listening to Chapter and Verse Ministry. 
We have newsletters, articles, podcasts, and videos posted on our website at www.cvm.church. We also post videos regularly on Rumble and on BitChute. Don't forget to like our video and to hit the bell icon if you want to know when another video is coming out. Today Say I won't.